Just like Roselle lens. There it is. Well, I'll be honest, D, she had a pair of glasses on him and my name tag on her. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Well, it's Sunday. You're relatively new here. I preach on Sunday once in a while. It doesn't last more than about 10 minutes, and so uh, you have to kind of bear with me on it. It's one of the privileges I have. So and hopefully we get some messages out of it. And hopefully you can learn a little something from it. You know, maybe you can, maybe you can't. But uh, at least uh, we're here, and we're here to sell something today. So uh, got to remind ourselves why we're here. And I want to talk just a minute this morning on little PMA. And I don't this we approach the new year. We're looking at another year. And every year as I look at a big year, I say, oh, my God, I hope this guy makes it this year. I hope this guy does it. God, this, maybe this is his year. And the same thing happens every year. The top third are on the top, the middle third are in the middle, and the bottom third are in on the bottom and struggling. And you always wonder kind of why, you know. And I guess it's no mystery why. It's how we program ourselves and how we talk to ourselves that puts us in the position that we get into because everything is cause and effect. And whether we believe it or not, we're constantly talking to ourselves all the time. We have the biggest conversations in the world to ourselves. Physically, we're all about the same. We're all healthy. We're Americans. We speak well English, and uh, we're motivated. And we have the same basic principles. But the difference between the guys that are on the very top all the time and those who are on the bottom is merely their self-talk. So, what I want to talk about briefly this morning for a few minutes and do an exercise. And the reason for the props is so maybe that it'll help you remember it. Uh, is our PMA, which is our mental preparedness. No other profession other than that professional athletics do you have to mentally prepare as much as you do in the selling profession. Athletics do it all the time. They go through more mental exercises of a ball game than they do physical. And they, they, they watch all their tapes and their glory days and all of their big wins over and over and over at the beginning of the season to remind themselves just how damn good they are. Because it's that kind of self-talk that makes you rise to the top of your profession, and they do it consistently. And uh, I've talked with Lou Tice, he's talked to many of them on image psychology, and he's talked to many pro football teams, and Lombardi, all of them did the same thing. They kept reminding each other how good they really were. And we want to try that lesson again this morning for just a minute. And I don't want to get into any great depths. It is Sunday, but so I will refer to Palm Sunday. the Bible a little bit. Palm Sunday. That's right. Palm Sunday. Now, I want to refer to that for just a minute so that you have an understanding, and it has a meaning. If you go back in biblical history to the Old Testament, the Old Testament is basically based on the history of the Hebrew nation. And from the beginning of man on a, all through the Hebrew nation is the Old Testament. It's, it's a study of, of, of their life and, and all of the things that were done prior to the time of the Messiah. And from... Abraham, who was father of the Jews, on down to, to uh, um, David. Now, David was the appointed king by God. When David was appointed king, David was told that his lineage there would be the direct descendants of the Messiah. Even though it was to happen a thousand years later, he was guaranteed that he would be the king. And David was one of the most remarkable uh, uh, people in the entire uh, Bible, if you ever studied the history of, of David. David ruled uh, the Israelite nation for some 40 years, and he died when he was about 70. He was a God-fearing man. He spoke directly to God. God gave him messages, and he was a brilliant man. He was brilliant that he had the strongest, he had the smallest force of, of a nation in the Hebrew nation, yet he was the most feared for his military. He, he, was, a, he was a statesman. He was a poet. He was a, a politician. David was one of the, the greatest kings of all times. And everything after David all refers back to David in the, in the uh, beginning. Because as David progressed and, and Solomon and on down through the begats, on down to the Messiah, everything refers back to what this great leader David did. Now, when you, hear, when you think of David to most people, you think of David and Bathsheba. Well, that was the one flaw that David had. David had an affair with Bathsheba. And God forgave him for that, but he gave him hell for doing it. If you look at your, your historians tell you that the, both of uh, David's daughter after that 
were raped. His one son killed another son. His wife eventually was raped. His one son, rebellious son, knowing Solomon would take the throne, he, he overthrew David for a short period of time. So David paid hell for that. But anyway, David has a lot of fine things. But David was known as a psalmist. Now, if you go back in biblical times, you see there weren't, it was all Hebrew back then. And the Hebrew alphabet, basically, is a very kind of a simple alphabet, but they had no vowels back in those days. They were done in block letters that read right to left. And so to connect the words, they would kind of put them together in different blocks together in different forms. But all of the history written was written on skins. You know, there was, no, there was no parchment in those days or anything, so they wrote them in skins. And all the records were kept by the church and by the, by the lords, okay? There weren't a lot of literate people back in those days. Uh, the Pharisees were the ones that described and interpreted everything for, for the people. And the, and the elders of the church and all the church records uh, were, were records of, uh, that we have today in our history books. And that's the only way they kept records. If you would bother to trace your family tree, like I have and others have, if you go back over 200 years on your family tree, you'll find the only records that are of your family are kept in the church. And the church was the ruler in those, in those times. They kept track of all births, all deaths, of taxes, who gets what. They settled disputes. And, every, and all your money was paid into the church. Okay, so the church was the only record keeper uh, that there, there was, basically, in, in those times. Now, we're talking 3,000 years ago, and right on up until about 200 years ago. And so that's where the records were kept. It was kept that way for the birthright. The eldest son always inherited uh, the land. He had to take care of the other kids, and it was just the rule of, of the world at that time. And so that's where all the records came from. But David, knowing this, and knowing, knowing he had to build a strong nation from some of these people who couldn't read or write, became known as the psalmist. Now, the David is still known today as the psalmist, and they claim the psalms are one of the greatest things that ever happened in history. They claim it's greater than the, than the, than the, uh, than the Greek um, uh, learnings of the Greeks, even, was the psalms. Now, David compiled 150 psalms, okay? 150 psalms. And he put all of his meanings from God. It was divine intervention that gave him these psalms. And what he taught all the people to do was to memorize the psalms. And he would play the psalms with a harp. And so that over and over and over again, you would repeat these psalms. And so these psalms then became your lifestyle. It became you. It became your thinking. This is how he kept the Israelite people together for so many, many years. And this is what kept the Israelite people going, even in the time of Moses. It kept the Israelite people going, because the Psalms were inbred upon the people. This is who we are. This is what we believe. The Psalms are full of praise, they're full of honor, they're full of a lot of good things, but basically it was a brainwashing session. Basically, David brainwashed the Israelite people. And that's what carried them. That's what carried them forward. And because they believed it, he wrote 150 songs, but he put it to song, and so that they could, they would enjoy doing it. They would enjoy repeating these songs over and over and over again. And so, what meaning does that have to us, okay? What meaning it has to us is our self-talk determines our end results here, okay? What we say to ourselves on a constant basis, and right now you're each talking to yourself, you're saying, I've heard that, I don't want to listen anymore, I've done this, I know that. You're basically talking to yourself 24 hours a day. 